Welcome to the podcast. I am Joel here with my dad. And I'm Rick. Hey, we're glad you're here today. Yeah, dad, today I want to talk about how to avoid distractions. Uh, now, I think what's funny about this is you have openly admitted that you have a problem getting distracted pretty easily. Oh, I don't have a problem with it. I'm great at it. You're great at getting distracted, right? So it's, it's not a problem. I enjoy it. Um, whereas I, it, you would not know that I'm your son because you, you were even just saying before the podcast that I was always pretty laser focused. So how much of getting, a, I guess to start with, how much of being distracted do you think is an element of personality? Um, and then... I think a lot of it is personality. Yeah? Yeah. I mean... I think a lot of it has to do with personality because uh, you're, well, you know, we talked earlier about the Enneagram numbers, you know, they're just certain, and, and those numbers are just those that tend to be more distracted, more laid back, not so um, focused and so driven. But there's laid back focused and then there's driven, or laid back distracted and driven distracted. So like your nine says that you actually get energy from being distracted, from not doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, you know, for example, for me to sit at home and try and write in a quiet room, oh, man, I just I, I, I just can't do it. I need some noise going on around me. And I cannot. You know? I cannot. Jonathan's always like, come down to this party party warehouse with me. It's actually a co-working <laughs> space, but to me it's a party warehouse. I'm like, <laughs> I cannot work in this environment. Everybody's yeah. all like, hey, buddy, what's up? Hey, hey, guy. I'm yeah. like, you can't work like that. Well, that's a little too much. But I do. There's actually uh, websites online where you could put coffee shop noises <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> See, See, I don't like you that. You got all these noises going in the background. You don't want music, just noises. But, like, yours, yours is interesting because you're a nine, so it says that they, you know, they kind of distract, they thrive on, distractions give them energy when they should be doing something else. Whereas, like, Karis, uh, who we had on another podcast, she's more kind of a high energy distraction. Like, it's like, ooh, another thing I can do. Yeah. Yay, yay. Uh, like, accomplishment distraction. So there's there's avoiding what you're supposed to be doing, and then there's, probably taking on more than you're well, supposed yeah. to be doing. That's interesting. But for me, I'm like all about eliminating every possible, probably too, too much, uh, of eliminating every possible distraction. So I think it would be interesting to hear, how, what have you been able to do to help you stay focused and not get distracted? And then I'll give you my take on it. I think it comes in a little naturally for me, but for people who, who are a little more easily distracted, yeah. Or like the nines that are like, it's just, ooh, there's something I can do to avoid what I need to do. Yay. Yeah. Um, what do you do? What have you done? Because, I mean, you've written books. You've started organizations. Obviously, you have some level of focus because that stuff doesn't yeah. just happen where you're just like, hey, look, it just happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of it, I think, had to do with kind of, um, well, it's, I mean, here we go. A lot of it was just, I felt like it was something that the Lord said to do. And so you start doing it and then it just sort of kind of, well, oh, gee, I've got to do this. And then that next, I don't, I didn't. You, oh, you're, you're talking about like writing a book or starting yeah. an organization. Yeah, so okay, it's not so like I'm, you. I'm supposed to write this book. And, and I mean, it took me like 10 years to really get after it, you know, when it really kind of came down to uh, just sensing from the Lord, look, this is an obedience now, issue. You're not talking about the one you want wrote in college. Uh, no, no, that was, you know, that was, a, well, I guess that's part of the deal. The one I wrote in college had to do with, that was my master's thesis, actually. And so, therefore, I had a deadline. I had to get it done, you know. And I think that would be a part of it is, like, I work well on deadlines mm. because, um, it, you know, I'm, I can't focus before, t like, when I'm preaching, I'm still fi figuring it out up to the Saturday. You know what I mean? If you're supposed to do that, you're, you're supposed to have your slides and all the graphics to the sound guys ahead of time so they can get these all done. I'm going, man, Sunday morning, I may change it, you know, <laughs> because I can't get focused until the very end. And I have something coming up like, okay, in three weeks, I've got this going, you know, so I need to think about it, think about it. Think. And I'd yeah, I'll think about it and have little pieces. But until the pressure's on, I just can't stay focused. So the structure of a deadline is what's helped. That stay helps focused. me. So yeah. how do you create that for you on an open-ended project? Well, it, you, um, <laughs> you don't, you don't, I mean, well, you kind of do like for example, with the book, there was no deadline on that. Except for your son nagging and nagging and nagging. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I really felt like it was something I had to do too. So I just finally set aside some time. For example, I just finally said to him at work, look, I'm not going to be in on Monday. I'm not going to be in on Friday and I'm going to stay at home and write during those It times. helps that you founded the organization, you started the thing. So. True, that's true. It did help. They so. use their, like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the problem is... <laughs> Don't go telling your boss, hey, I feel like I need to write my novel. <laughs> I won't right. be showing up on Mondays and Fridays. Well, he, 
he will give you a whole lot more time than to write it too. Yeah, probably. he's like, so you why don't you just take the whole week, that's yes. right. unpaid leave, and never <laughs> come back? That's right. Don't even bother to call me when the book's finished. I'll just check it out there's online. Your, there's your focus. Yeah, yeah. It helped that I founded the organization. But on the other hand, the reason I had not been doing it was because I felt like I need to be the one setting the example here. So for me to take two days off, because from their perspective, <laughs> he only works three days a week. You know, mm. so just that being in the office, I felt like as the leader of the organization, I needed to be there. My Which there are there. probably seasons for that. Yeah. That and to so that's why I need to let them know, look, I'm not just taking Monday and Friday off. This is what I'm doing. So th that's one thing I, I talk to a lot of pastors that are like, man, I really want to write a book. But they feel like they need to be in the office when their staff is in the office to be the lead example of what yeah. it's like. So how do you get, I mean, what about the element of a vision for something like well, with me, it came to a point where I felt like this is obedience to the Lord. And so I yeah. just explained to the to the director, the fellow who ran the day-to-day -day operations, I'm not going to be here. I really feel like this is an obedience thing. I really need to do this. Right. And and I think pastors at some point, um, if you really feel called to do that, right. or maybe you, you need to have that conversation and to say, um, I'm not going to be in on this but, day. But then, man, when you make that commitment, then you're you really got to use that day for writing. That's yeah. the hard part is... Because other distractions come up. Yeah, you know? that's that. Especially if your wife knows you're off that day. Right. You're off, quote, oh, unquote, that day. You're not day. working today? Yeah. Yeah. What's that law? Uh, time expands to fill the, or work expands to yeah. fill the amount of time allotted? Parkinson's law. Parkinson's yeah. law, yeah. So that's could, so true. It could take you all day to write the letter to your grandson. Yeah. Because, uh, oh, I didn't find paper. And, oh, I need to make some yeah. coffee. And, yeah, go yeah. sit down. Oh, look, look, there's a bird out the window. Oh, it's noon now. I need to have lunch. And, it, yeah. That's what can happen with, with, with that, I mean, yeah. the distraction of and that. And that's why I went to a coffee shop. I always called it my secret undisclosed location. Nice. You know? <laughs> because if I did it at home, it, it, there's always other stuff I could be doing. So, but that's, okay, so that's such a weird thing to me. Like, I don't even think that way. You're like, I'm going to go to a really distracting place so I don't get distracted. Huh? Well, you can, <laughs> yeah, okay. What is that? <laughs> I don't know. Because I had nothing else to do. I'm at a coffee shop with coffee and my computer. What else can I do there? I I can't go grab a snack. I can't make the bed. I can't look. You know. So it's not so much the distractions of noises and stuff like that. It's distractions of things to do for Other you. stuff, yeah. yeah. Interesting. There was some old guy who used to talk about prayer. He says, whenever you pray, you'll find all kinds of distractions, even if it's just adjusting the blinds, right. you know, to make sure they're all level and square. And that's the way it is with me. You know, I look around and go, oh, wow. Oh, man. I need to clean this room up. I need to put that stuff away. That's been sitting over in the corner for so long, and I need to put that away. And, oh, what about this? Oh, man, what's that over there? And before long, your desk is just immaculately, and your office is really straight. And, and you order, got... And you spent the whole day. Right. No, and by <laughs> Friday, when it's time to write again, it's a mess again. So, mm. so I just went to the coffee shop. So the, in the terms of distractions for you, there's the element of when you create an environment where you don't have things to fix or to... I think that is a challenge for people, too, because it's like, oh, man, you know. No other options. I just, that's only what all that works with me is no other options. So, okay, so it's not a matter of the noise. See, that's the challenge for me is just the noise. I can't, like, when I get focused on yeah. writing, even if Elise comes in and breaks my pattern, I've learned you just drop it when she comes in. But well, see, and that would be different because that's a child coming in. And, and if there were people at the coffee shop who were coming up, hey, Bob, how you doing? I haven't seen you. That would be different. But And I would bring headphones. Yeah. Or earbuds or whatever. And sometimes plug into some kind of noiseless music. You know, what do you say? Music that didn't have a real pattern. Do you, do you put on the coffee shop soundtrack in the coffee shop? <laughs> With your headphones on? Uh, that was before I found the coffee oh, shop okay. soundtrack. Okay. You know, yeah, I had to use the real thing then. You like, know. I got to put these headphones so I can't hear this coffee shop <laughs> with, right. with the coffee shop. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is that coffee shop, you can control the volume. Yeah, right, you know, I guess so. so. You hear the clanging in the background. And it would be kind of, you'd be there writing and all of a sudden somebody starts making one of those, well, the latte where they turn on that steam machine. Yeah. <laughs> so I did wear headphones and things, but but it, it was the idea of, it's like driving. I think, I think pretty well when I'm driving because there's nothing else I can do and driving doesn't take full attention. Yes. You know, and especially I mean, freeway type. There's neurological science behind that too, that they say that when your mind is at rest, I think we've talked about this before too. Uh, when your mind is at rest, you come, they the shower, um, for me, it's yeah. mowing. When your mind is not focused on the specific thing, it's like your best ideas come. So it, yeah. it kind of helps you. There's not. So it keeps you alert. Yeah. Because you're driving. And that's what it is. I'm alert because I'm in this coffee shop and I'm not just going to be nodding right. off. And I'm not going to drive my mower into the fence. Yeah. Right. I, but yeah. 
But, but it doesn't require, it, it's so much auto uh, motion, your, yeah. your brain just work, operating on automatic. So there's that element for you as an as this nine type personality that says um, there's these are things that I it, it forces me that there's one project in front of me. That's all I can do. One project in front of me. Not that and sip my coffee. Okay. What do you think for people like? And we sh- maybe we should have brought Karis in on this, but she because she's a three type, right? And threes, I, every three I've always known is like, ooh, another thing I can do, another thing I can do, fill in time. Oh, I can cram that in this. You know, I've got yeah. seven minutes in my day. Yeah. I could. You know, I could do that in that seven minutes. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? What in the world? And I, I'm curious. I, I think for folks like that, the key is, uh, again, I'm speaking for, this is based on something that comes, comes a little more naturally to me, but um, was it S- Antoine saint Paris said, perfection is attained not when there's nothing more to add, but then when there's nothing more to subtract. And I just think the way to keep from getting distracted is to remove everything that could potentially distract you. Um, now again, sometimes that's just not possible, but like, well, that's kind of what I was saying there. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I guess it just looks different, but, but I think one of the challenges for people that are like, Ooh, I can fit more in my schedule is you've got to remove some things that, yeah, to create space to do this. So, uh, well, for example, and I, I think one of the challenges too, is you've really got to figure out what do you, why, right? The why. So your why was, I feel like God told me to write this book, for example, or yeah. I told, feel like God told me to start this organization. I feel very passionate about writing too. I like having written. I'm not really a fan of having of writing. Uh, I don't love crafting words and stuff, but I love having written. And so I feel very passionate about it. Um, but I have chosen to not pursue, example, certain ways of writing or certain things I could write in because I feel like those would distract me from what I'm really specifically called to. For example, I'm not a fan of article writing. For a while I pursued that, but I'm like, yeah. this isn't really getting to what I want to accomplish. And in some ways you really have to figure out why are you doing it? And then does what you're doing fit into why you're doing it? Yeah. Because I, otherwise you could just, you take yeah. on everything. Well, I think that goes with uh, the scripture, uh, you know, where there is no vision. Yeah. Uh, in the King James is where there is no vision, the people perish, which it, I, I'm, that's probably a good translation. But it really, instead of perishing, like, you know, just you've turned into a pile of dust or something or ash, what it really is talking about, I saw it in the Spanish version say, uh, where there's no vision, the people say desentrenado. They're like uh, on a rampage. They're like no constraints. They're Frenar just. Frenar is to break. There's no breaks. Yeah. You're just, yeah, frenar to break. Frenar. Um, yeah. So you're, and, and of course, when I first read that, I related it to frenos, the breaks. And say desenfrenada. I didn't really know what that word meant, but I saw front I saw brakes in there, and I thought. And all of a sudden, a picture came of the time we were going down a mountain hill, and the guy ahead of us lost his brakes. Mm-hmm. And you're on those mountain roads, those curvy mountain roads with no brakes. You understand? You're just weaving, and just you're hoping you just don't kill yourself. And that's kind of what it's like when you don't have a vision. It's like your brakes are out on a mountain, right? And so you're just you're going here and you're going there, and you're dodging this and trying to do that. And the vision keeps can keep you focused to where you're not just weaving here and there and doing whatever comes your way. That's the the other. I think it's the NIV, the or NVI in Spanish. Also says ex extravia. They start to wander around when mm-hmm. they don't have a vision. And I see that with a lot of people. Is that's what causes the distraction? It's like, oh, look, a flashing light over there. Oh, yeah. Ooh, let's look at that flashing light. And then they wonder why nothing really gets accomplished. But you got to. I mean, you really have to channel the energy. If you don't channel it. Um, and that's where I think channeling it is like removing anything that could keep you from going down the track well, you want to go on. And, and that's what you were saying about, okay, I'm not going to write these journal articles because this is my vision. This is where I'm going. Yeah. This is what I'm focused on. And I, I mentioned you earlier, it, when I first thought about that too, it, for some reason it always makes me think of a toboggan run, like at the Olympics, you know, mm-hmm. where the toboggan is going down and it's got these rails, which theoretically it keeps it in if the guys are driving and slowing down enough. And so you know where you're going and you're staying within the path. You're not just wandering around here and there, but you're in the, in the groove. Yeah. So where there is no vision, the people are outside of that groove and they're over here and they're over there. But where there's a vision, everything is focused and you're going in one direction. Well, and that's what essentially what discipline is. It's channeling everything and it's saying, I'm going to say no to some good things to make sure that everything I've got is pointing in the same direction. Yeah. And I mean, that's where I am with, with, a lot of things I've done. Um, one of the things that when I when I was starting to do this ministry, I talked to that coach and he was telling me the um, 
I should avoid. He's like, there's a lot of different platforms you could use to promote what you're doing. But he's like, you need to pick one and just drive at it. He said, because what will happen is you'll get, you'll get scattered. And he's like, you're trying to hit YouTube and Facebook and um, Instagram and you know, all the new ones, TikTok and all that. And he's like, and if you're trying to get that across and it's just you, he's like, it'd be one thing if you had a staff to do it for yeah. you. But if it's just you, he's like, you're just going to get it worn out because you're, you're trying to hit everything and you're always trying to keep up and there's always a new social media platform. Oh, I need to be on that. I remember back in the way, somebody's like, are you on Periscope? And I'm like, I don't know what Periscope is. <laughs> so I went to get on Periscope and like three weeks later, Facebook bought it. And it's like, well, there goes Periscope. So like there's, it's always moving. But if you know what you're trying to accomplish and you can say, it's, it's not something that I need to engage in over here. I don't need to have... Um, and when you channel in on that and you nail down that one platform, for example, um, I think it really helps you because you're not always so scattered. And so like, that's what yeah. I found for me. Like social media is just not a really great place for me to get my content out there. Yeah. Um, what I find for me is getting up in front of people, um, or doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I channel all my energy to doing one-on-one -on -one coaching or standing in front of people, whether it's the church or a, a university or a, a conference and that's what helps me, keeps me from getting distracted. And I always ask myself, is what I'm about to do here going to help me accomplish that goal? Now, granted, there are sometimes I think God will ask us to do something that doesn't seem to, uh, you know, in our rational mind, you're like, that's not going to accomplish our goal. And when that happens, just do it, right? Right, yeah. Do it. But in general, I think one of the best ways to avoid distraction is figure out what you really want and then figure out, is this really going to get that? And that's what's hard is if you've got a nebulous idea, kind of a cloudy idea of what you want. I mean, for example, if you're on social media and you're saying, well, I just want to be famous, right? Well, then you're going to try every platform, right? I just want to be known. I want to be acknowledged, right? Then you're going to, but you're never going to, well, first yeah. of all, chasing fame is very ephemeral. That's going to come and go. Like it'll, uh, you'll be famous today and then not, 15 minutes. Yeah, maybe, it's your yeah. 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. Um, but if you're identifying what you're trying to accomplish, that, like for me, books is my thing. I'm like, you know, one of the best ways, you, you told me this a long time ago. You said, was it Charles Wesley? that uh, Spurgeon. 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 Mm -hmm. The reason that we know so much about him was because he took time to write down things. Yeah, and there was a right. much more famous, more, more eloquent preacher just down the street from Spurgeon. Nobody really knows who he was because he never took time to write. So the writing outlasts you. And I've realized for me, with what I feel passionate about, for leaving things for a, a legacy for a lease and and you know, my, for my daughter, is, is writing is where it's at. I mean, there's just to, to the yeah. writing of books, there is no end, but to the writing of books, there is no end. So yeah. um, the book thing is, is a, a powerful thing to me. And so I used to write these articles and stuff, and I'd just be like, these aren't, a, I spent a, you know, three hours crafting an article when I could have put that into a book that's going to have a lot yeah. longer term instead of it just being something people flash up online and watch for a few minutes. So it yeah. it's being channeled on that what's your why and then, eliminating everything, but you got to get really clear about what your why is. Yeah, and the problem with that too is you have to let go of a lot of good things. Yeah, yeah. For example, one of the reasons I think Commission Every Nation, the mission agency that I founded there, is so successful is we send missionaries. That's what we do. Yeah. Well, so somebody says, well, do you plant churches? I say, if any of our missionaries plant churches, we plant churches. Do you run orphanages? If any of our missionaries run orphanages, yeah. we run orphanages. But we don't, so somebody asked me one time, says, so what do you guys do? Do <laughs> we send missionaries? We send missionaries. Yes. You don't. You don't do that, and you don't do this. And in churches, it's the same way. I heard of a church. In fact, I think you know it may have changed now, but the church that produced U version, Life Church, there. From what I understand, they felt their vision was to produce uh, what do you call it? Tech technology for the churches. And so U version is out there free. They they offer a lot of other online resources free to churches. That's what they do. But that means they, uh, at the time anyway, that I first learned it, they said, we don't feed the homeless. We don't, you know, do this. We don't do that. We don't do this. This is what we do. And there are other churches that are housing the homeless and feeding the hungry and clothing the poor. And you, you can't do all of that. And you have to figure out what God has called you to do. Yeah. And then do that. Which, that's an over... That's what's really hard too because when you see the need is great and there's always somebody who thinks you should be meeting this need or that need, yeah. but there's the limitation of resources, which is really what distraction comes down to is you only got so much mental space, you only got so much time. financial space, time space. What have you decided is your mission that you're focused on or yeah. vision? That's true. I mean, that, that's what I see a lot of times uh, 
with churches that they're so spr- I think this was something we we kind of had we we got on we we would jump on you a lot of times is as a pastor you'd be like people would be like hey we should start a, a small group for people with chihuahuas and you'd be like okay that sounds great why not and I'd be like dad <laughs> what the f- what are you doing <laughs> like <laughs> well there's nobody else ministering to chihuahua owners <laughs> yes no but but I would be like well, how does that accomplish the end game of it but again you're more laid back you're like oh that's cool it, it hits some people but I, we'd always be like channel 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 ever, all your resources. But a lot of people get upset about that because then the people with chihuahuas are like, but we wanted a group for people with chihuahuas. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, but does that really serve the purpose of what we feel like the bo- this unique expression of the body of Christ is trying to do? And um, that's the problem. I mean, you know, where Paul, I think it's a misapplication to say Paul says, I, I'm all things to all men so that by you know God's grace I might win a few. You know, I, I, you could look at that and you go, that's an individual and what he was talking about is when I'm with people who keep the law, I'm not going to be running around doing, you know, I'm not going to be breaking the law in front of them. But I'm with, when I'm with, I'm not going to hesitate to go into a Gentile's home right? when I'm with people who, when I'm with Gentiles, because I will be as, as one who doesn't keep the law to them as a, eh, it's not the right term, but, you know, in other words, I'm not going to be all hung up on the law and not go into a Gentile's home. But if I'm in a Jewish community, then I'm going to respect them as well. So I think it has more as much to do with respect because if you're, again, you're trying to reach everybody, you're probably not going to reach anybody. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's what, it, that's I mean, a really hard, that, that's the, re, it comes back to the resources thing again is, exactly is you've only got so much and if you channel in on something specific and if everybody channels in on something specific, everybody's going to get reached. And that's the thing. You realize it's the whole body working together. And so this church might really be awesome yeah. at caring for the poor. Right. You know? And you just may not have. And I learned this really one time when somebody came to me. And they said, oh, it may have been you. I can't remember. Somebody says, so who do you want to reach in this community as, as pastor in the church mm-hmm. in Corpus? And I said, well, I want to reach everybody. That was me. That was, that was me. You. Yeah. You can't reach everybody. Said, yeah. Well, why can't we reach everybody? Well, first of all, are you going to have, are you going to have, Langu- uh, Filipino uh, Tagalog services. Yeah. Well, no, I don't think we're going to have Tagalog. Then you're not going to reach a Tagalog-speaking person. Are you going to, what about the homeless guy that lives across the street? Well, the buses don't run on Sunday morning. You know, they don't start running until noon. How, are you going to be able to reach him? Well, probably not. Okay, and so you begin to narrow it down. And you realize, okay, as much as I want to reach everybody, there are people who are not going to walk into this church because it's where it's located, because of, the name because of the color of your of, sign yeah. yeah like who knows there's yeah who knows and so you have to realize okay i'm not going to reach everybody yeah and then i had to work it backwards some people might go well i feel called to reach this group and i just had to kind of be who i was and see who came <laughs> right you know, yeah, that's true okay well i guess that's who i'm gonna reach well and then there's the reality of yeah i wish i could reach other people and i'll try i'll make an extension but yeah. this is this is kind of who shows up here? Yeah, around, we tried. Yeah. We had a little Spanish translation, and that you know maybe reach two or three. They could bring their grandmother or somebody who only spoke Spanish. You know, right? We, we would do little things like that, but it wasn't going to be a Spanish speaking church, right? Whereas a Spanish, like a Spanish speaking church with the heart, Spanish speaking church is going to yeah. reach that group of people. And it wasn't going to have even if we had language Spanish. In it, even if I started preaching in Spanish, <laughs> that'd be pathetic. But even if I were fluent in it and preaching in Spanish. It still wouldn't have that culture feel. Right, that's true. Yeah, it'd be. There's more to it than just the language. It's a whole culture that's connected that's true. with any language. Well, and so I think that when it comes back to the distractions thing too, that's I mean that that's across the board with. When you know what you're trying to accomplish, and you get really honest about this is working to accomplish this, this, and again, sometimes there's some trial and error in it, right? Oh like, yeah, there's stuff that you'd be surprised works. You're like, well, who would have thought that worked? But it worked. So there is some trial and error. But if you're I get concerned about people that are always trying new things um, in an effort to, I, I feel like in, it's actually just to keep them kind of entertained. Like, oh, here's something yeah. new I can do. But then they never accomplish what they really want to accomplish because they've divided their resources. They've divided their loyalties, their energy, their time, their money. And when you've got it all spread out all over the place, of course, I mean, that's the other complicated part though too is King Solomon says, cast, you know, send your bread out upon the waters. Basically he's saying, it says, cast your bread in the waters on some translation. Like, what does that mean? He's basically saying, send it out in the ships because once the ships go out and trade it for stuff, you'll get stuff back eventually. Um, so there is an element of that. Like, try a bunch of different stuff, but if you're always trying a bunch of different stuff and you never stick with something, you may never get to where you really want to get in terms of accomplishing something. Yeah. 
But then what you're saying on the other side of that is, you know, that analysis paralysis to where oh, I'm just going to keep thinking this through until I've got oh, yeah. all the things worked out and there can be no problem and i got all the answers and then you try it and it flops anyway. Yes, that's, yeah. And so you, you, and a lot of it really has to do with hearing from the Lord. I mean, I know that sounds hyper spiritual, but you kind of sense in your heart that this is what God's put in my heart to do. Mm -hmm. And then you try it. And it may, be, it may totally wash out, and maybe you need to try it another way, or maybe, maybe it was just something you really wanted to do. So on a practical level, staying, how to stay, just keep from getting distracted. Um, I think one of the, I mean, this is like super practical. I think one of the biggest things that I've done uh, for many years is I write down the top five things I need to get done that week. And um, I don't do it on a day-to-day -day basis because sometimes you'll set out to do something on the day, the one day, and you know, oh, Joe's not in today. Ah, Monday's shot, right? So yeah. what's the top five things you need to get done this week? And then what's the secondary five things? And if you can kind of spread it out like that, um, and I guess you could do that on a day-to-day -day basis, but sometimes stuff just can't get done. I've found that super helpful for me to keep from getting distracted. And I usually spend, and this is a really big part of it, I usually spend Sunday evening, I sit down for about 30 minutes at my desk, my lamp on, and I think through the week, what do I need? What are those five to 10 things I need to do this week? And I've found that that's tremendous for me. It helps me get accomplished a lot. And sometimes I get it all done on Monday and then I'm like, ooh, I can come up with a new list of stuff to do. But if you're always coming up, I mean, there's always more you can do, right? Yeah. But if you come up with those five key things, 10 key things, that's what's been super helpful for me. You got any practical, super practical advice for yeah, somebody I who's remember, a little Yeah, it reminds me of a story when I were in management classes, they talked about and this happened with Vanderbilt or one of those guys in the, one of those early... Um, steel barons or whatever, um, where he went to a consultant who said, hey, I want you, would you come and consult with me and help me make my time more efficient? And he goes, well, I really don't have time tied up right now. But he said, I'll tell you what, I'll send you a little piece of paper and uh, give you a little hint, and then you pay me what you think it's worth. And so he wrote him, and, you know, within a month, Vanderbilt sent him a check for $3 million or something, you know. And all he told him to do is he says, as you say, every Sunday night, just write down what your five and priority, what's your number one priority for the week, number two, number three, number four, number five priority, and work on number one till you get it done. Don't move on. Huh. Work on number one till you get it done. Now, again, if Bob's not in yeah. on Monday, you're going to have to go to number two. But basically work Really? On that was his advice? That was his advice. A guy oh, paid, I came upon $3 million advice on my own? How'd you happen to do that? <laughs> yeah. I had to go to school for it. Um, but the idea being that at the end of the day, even if you didn't get even if you didn't get number one done, you knew you spent all of your time on the thing that was the most important. Wow, yeah, that's good. So I, I didn't even get in. I didn't even scratch the surface on getting number one done, but at yeah. least I spent the whole day working on the thing that's most important because that's what I decided was most important. Which, real quick on that, how to evaluate what's most important, I think that's where the Pareto principle comes in. The idea that yeah. usually 20% of in inputs create 80% of outputs. So you see that with churches like, 20% of the people tithe, then it funds pretty much the whole ministry, if you really look at it statistically. Um, and usually 20% of what you do brings 80% of your results. So if you can figure out what that 20% is and give your best energy to that, um, I do this in my coaching program with people, is I, I say, what's your 20%? And then give your best energy. Usually your best energy comes in the morning from, yeah. the, t from the first four hours of w when you wake up. So can you give your best energy to what's the most important in terms of what makes you the most money if you're an individual, like a... a business like you run your own business or what brings the best results in terms of connecting with people um then use that like right. use that 20 percent, and then you'll get the 80 percent um and when you when you figured that out then you can know what's the priority for that week yeah well the other thing is you know you always eat the frog first <laughs> uh, by that what i mean is what we what i tend to do is i have a list of five things to do and i want to do the easiest thing first right you know or the thing that's the least the, uh, and you always put the hardest thing off for last and so if you eat the frog first whatever's the hardest thing do that first right you which know? i naturally do that i always do the yeah. hardest thing first but yeah. i don't i look at it and i go oh man that's gonna take a lot of time let me just <sighs> let me knock out these five little things and they really aren't that important but at least i get to check five things off my yeah. list Woo you know yes and the one thing adds up to 10 other small things, right? Yeah, and I didn't actually, I never ate the frog, and that's what really needed to be done today. So if you eat the frog first, everything else takes great after that, you know? <laughs> so that's, well, that's the point of eat the frog. Well, that's good. I don't know if this has been helpful for anybody, but it is interesting how there are some people that are a little more prone to distraction and some people are a little less prone to distraction. But 
It is amazing that even people who are prone to distraction have the capacity to accomplish great things. Oh, God can do amazing things for all of us. And the awesome thing is when he uses those of us who are terribly distracted by squirrels and nuts and anything else, he gets all the glory because you know it couldn't have been me. If you liked what you heard, please consider sharing this with a friend. For more information, visit joelmalm.com or rickmalm.com. Thanks for listening.